welcome to the last lecture on cases where we will discuss uh, the cas hierarchy design in the context of multi core systems so far we have looked at the single core system uh, having uh, multiple levels of cas like l1 l2 l3 but uh, modern processors are actually uh, multi core based systems where they have multiple processors you can assume multiple uh, pipelines uh, and then each of them have their own uh, private l1 l2 cas and there's a big uh, uh, shared last level cache that is shared by all the cores. And all these cores are actually connected through an interconnect. It can be a bus or it can be any uh, advanced interconnect that kind of provides uh, a, a way in which all the cores can uh, communicate with uh, each other, right? So in the single core, we had a pretty simple design that all the caches belong to only one core, but in a multi-core system where you have multiple cores, now the question comes whether the caches should be shared or private, right? So obviously the private uh, caches or the caches closer to the processor like L1 cache, we can't make them uh, shared among all the cores because then it will lead to a bandwidth issue, right? Imagine uh, 100 monkeys uh, trying to eat one banana, right? So there's a similar kind of analogy here and but but uh, as we go away from the processor we can actually make it shared and then uh, the reasoning behind a last level uh, shared cache and not the private caches we'll find uh, there are applications which are kind of fitting inside private l1 l2 cache which are called the core cache fitting applications uh, so so their working set fits into the private l1 or l2 then you will find uh, some applications which are rlc fitting Right, so uh, their the working set will be uh, same as the LLC size, and then you will find something which is thrashing the LLC. That means its uh, LLC capacity is actually not uh, good enough to accommodate all the data. Right, so if we have a shared LLC, uh, it may happen that one core is actually uh, not utilizing the LLC uh, completely, and then the other core can actually utilize the entire LLC in that point of time. Right. And uh, in, in the same context, it, it's actually a good trade-off that we should not have a private LLC because some of the applications are uh, L1, L2 uh, fitting. So there is no point of having another cache level, which, which is only private to a particular core. And so let, let's have it shared and uh, let's everyone access it depending on their memory footprint. So in the commercial machines, you will find that the last level cache or the L3 cache is not a single monolithic cache, uh, 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 the small cache like L1, okay? And uh, usually it is sliced or banked. So, and the goal behind uh, the sliced or banked design is to provide bandwidth. So this is just an interconnect, uh, which connects all the private caches. Uh, it's, it's kind of a ring-like uh, structure where all the L2 CAS uh, can send requests and then ask for the data. And it's also uh, uh, accessible by uh, all the slices in the last level CAS. So if we have a, let's say, 4 MB uh, LLC, and if we can create 1 MB slices instead of uh, a large 4 MB CAS, so what will happen is all these slices are actually shared by all the cores. It's not private to any particular core, okay? But if you look at in terms of uh, latency, uh, core zero accessing slice zero will be faster than core zero accessing slice, uh, let's say S3, right? Uh, because of the uh, additional delay that you may encounter uh, while getting the data from uh, S3. So S0 is actually closer to L1. So similarly, you will find a 16 core, 32 core system, you'll have around like 16 slices. And uh, some of the slices will uh, respond uh, fast uh, or faster compared to other slices. So that's why uh, the caches are also known as NUCA caches, uh, which, which means it's a non-uniform cache uh, access based design. Okay, it's not a fixed latency uh, cache design. Okay. so, so you can go and look at uh, recent uh, commercial machines and then try to find out uh, how many slices they have, how, how they are uh, indexed, right? So, so now your indexing mechanism should have something to uh, find out a slice number. So on a load from a particular core, uh, the load request uh, should be partitioned into tag, index, 
and along with uh, you need to find the slice number you can use uh, any bits among this tag index to to determine a slice number or you can borrow a few bits from here and uh, determine a slice number okay so uh, then let's move on to uh, the cache hierarchies or different kinds of cache hierarchies that are possible so if you look at the cache hierarchy so there's a processor here uh, let's say core zero and let's say there is a memory here the dram right and this uh, hierarchy actually determines when you get a miss uh, in what way you are filling the data okay so the first one is called the inclusive cache hierarchy where the data or content of private caches or the upper level caches are also present in the lower level cache okay so LLC is kind of superset that's why it's called uh, inclusive uh, it, it makes it pretty easy for a multi-core system, especially if other cores wants to find out wh whether a particular data is present uh, in uh, other core by, by looking at the shared LLC, right? Um, but, but the downside is the effective capacity goes down. So the effective gas capacity will be lower now, right? Because there is redundant data. Whatever you have in L1, L2, you also have that in LLC. Uh, another point is whenever you replace something from the lower level cache, you have to send a request to the upper level uh, called uh, the back invalidation request, which makes sure that the block is invalid. Whatever blocks you have uh, replaced here, let's say this block is replaced, you have to go and search for that block in the private cache and then and, and invalidate that. Why? Because just to maintain the inclusivity property. So inclusive caches were there in the commercial machines. Even today, you will find some of the machines are having uh, uh, inclusive caches. But uh, most of the commercial machines have moved to non-inclusive caches where there is no agreement between um, different levels of cache. It's like you get a response from memory, you fill it into the last level cache, you also fill it into the upper level cache. That's all. If you evict something from here, no need to do anything here, right? And then the so basically there is no pact between uh, two levels of caches. The other extreme is exclusive hierarchy where it, it's a bit different on a miss, you take the response from memory and put it in the private cache, the L1 and L2, only on a replacement from private cache, you put it in the last level cache. So this is, this is like a, a large victim cache, right? So if you talk about the cache capacity, uh, exclusive cache, uh, hi exclusive hierarchy will actually provide the maximum effective cache capacity because uh, if a block is present in L1, L2, it won't be present here, or if a block is present in LLC, it won't be present here, right? That's why it's exclusive cache. So uh, these are the three different cache hierarchy. You can think about uh, various trade-offs in terms of uh, performance, uh, energy, uh, traffic, right? Uh, and then and other stuff. With this, let's move on to a, a subtle problem that usually comes with the multi-core systems. And when we have uh, caches, and uh, since we have uh, private caches, and uh, that, that problem becomes even more uh, uh, crucial to solve, so uh, the problem is a cache coherence problem. So before jumping into this problem, let's understand what's the context. The context here is there are three different processors or cores. So you can assume core zero, core one, core two, okay, or core P one, P two, P three, whatever you name it, and they are not running independent applications. So you can't assume that okay, this core is running your YouTube video, this core is running your GCC, uh, nothing like that. They are actually running a single application. Okay, let, let's say some uh, parallel uh, ML app. Okay, the key is the parallel or multi threaded where all the cores are actually sharing the memory, which means uh, uh, in, in the previous uh, uh, cases that we have discussed so far, all the cores are independent. So, the, so their virtual address space were uh, kind of completely different and they were not sharing anything at the uh, physical address space. But here, uh, even though their virtual address space are different, they actually share uh, uh, some data structures, right? And then they share and communicate. 
So think about a parallel matrix multiplication where multiple threads try to work together and then finally, you know, uh, get a, a result of uh, uh, multi multiplication of two uh, different matrices, right? So, so let's assume that there is a shared variable uh, sum which is shared by all the cores, okay? And let's look at what's the problem. So to make it simple, let's assume we have only uh, one private cache and then, then let's say we have this DRAM. Yeah, although we have LLC, but, but let's assume we, we just have DRAM, right? So to start with, uh, let's say the uh, variable is actually there in the DRAM. Uh, uh, the value of the variable is zero, okay? And then let's say processor one wants to read it. So it reads, uh, remember your valid bit, right? Because now it's a valid data, you uh, marked it valid. Then processor uh, P2 wants to read it. Uh, again, it gets the data from uh, DRAM. Again, it's valid, uh, no, no harm so far. But now let's say processor P1 writes it. So that makes it dirty. So the value has changed from zero to three. We have changed uh, to D. Now at this moment, you look at the content. So one core has value zero, DRAM has value zero, and another core has value three, okay? Let's move on. Let's assume that the other core uh, overrides that particular uh, shared variable to something called seven, right? So now we, we have three different values for the same variable sum. So sum has, possible values are 0, 3, and 7, right? But what 7 is actually the correct or updated or the most latest value. Now, if, if we continue by doing this, the problem is in the future when the processor 1 tries to read, the cache will respond to the value 3, right? And which is wrong. But if P2 wants to read, it will get a value 7, which is actually correct, right? And think about, let's say some IO device or some network packet is coming to memory directly and it wants to read the value of that particular variable and then it uh, reads uh, zero, right? So it's a completely uh, a messed up system where uh, the content of a particular address has gone for a toss, right? So this is the coherence problem. The problem is if multiple uh, cores, uh, they, they uh, kind of cast the same block or the same address, how do they ensure that they all see a consistent state, right? It should be same for all. It should not be different for all the different codes. So the solution is uh, we should uh, make sure these two properties are satisfied. The problem comes from the writes, uh, similar to your pipeline hazards, right? Read after read is not a hazard. Un unless you get a W somewhere, uh, you don't get any uh, problem, right? So similarly here, unless someone writes, then it's not a problem. Even if you have thousands of codes sharing a particular variable. So what we need to uh, make sure is all the writes, they become visible to all other cores. So in the previous example, when core uh, one updates the value of sum to three, then that should have been visible to uh, all the other cores. And the second key point is the order at which the right, right operation is hap happening, that order should be visible uh, to all the cores, right? So basically it's, it's a constraint that all the cores who are sharing a particular cache block should be aware of what's happening to that particular cache block, right? So we, we need a protocol which kind of ensures these two properties. And then that, that's called the cache coherence protocol, which is pretty uh, useful protocol in the modern systems to make sure our data is uh, consistent uh, across the cores. So there are two ways by which we can uh, provide right propagation or right serialization. One is whenever we write to a particular cache line, let, let's send a message to all other cores and they should invalidate their blocks because like you have updated, there is no point other, other uh, cores uh, keeping the uh, stale values, right? Uh, the other uh, possibility is uh, whenever you write or update, you simultaneously broadcast the updated data to others. So this is the update policy. Of course, in terms of bandwidth, this will be costly because now you have to send data to all other cores every time you write something into your own cache. So let's look at a simple uh, cache coherence protocol called MSI protocol, uh, where uh, the M stands for modified, S stands for shared, I is invalid as usual, okay? So the state bits will be part of your uh, task store. So along with your valid, invalid, um, replacement bits, 
now you will have coherence bits okay and the the semantics of uh, this coherent states is when a particular block is in the m state that means you are the owner of the block only one core has that particular uh, block in its private cache memory contains the stale value even if someone wants to get the data for that particular address from memory he or she has to consult that particular core who has the block in m state okay and there is another state called shared state where multiple cores are actually having the same address in the caches and memory is also up to date okay so uh, this, this provides sharing among all the cores as long as no one is writing uh, everyone is reading and invalid is invalid that means it's not uh, valid right it's not present okay so two uh, kinds of transactions or two kinds of uh, requests can be generated from a processor or from a core one is the typical read or a load right when you are reading something uh, with this protocol you will actually go to s state if you want to write something remember you can't write with the s state uh, because s state meaning you are actually sharing the data along with other cores and even the memory contains the updated value so you have to send a exclusive request so that you can go to the m state and then you can overwrite because you will be the owner of that particular block okay so let, let's see a state machine what happens from a master course uh, perspective where one core is actually trying to read or write right so initially let's say we have started with the invalid state and we want to write right so whenever we want to write we will generate a read exclusive request and move to the modified state whenever we want to read uh, we will send a uh, read uh, request in our interconnect or in the bus and we will move to the S state, right? In the S state, we can continue our doing read without informing uh, others because we are in S state. That means anyone else can also read without informing others. And the moment you want to write something, again, you have to generate a read exclusive request and then move to M state, okay? So this is from the master core, whoever wants to read or write what, what is happening and once you are in the m state you are, you are free to do anything you want because you are the owner of that particular block okay now let's look at the rest of the course when a master core is saying okay i want to read or i want to write how do others respond okay so this is how you should look at the state machine that's why it's called the bus side and not the processor side so let's say you are in the i state and then someone else wants to read or write so doesn't matter right you don't have the block so nothing to worry you are in S state, someone wants to read, go ahead, no issue, right? Because S state allows uh, reading from multiple cores. But you are in M state and someone wants to read, right? That means your ownership should now move to S state. Now the core who is requesting a read request will go to S state and you will also go to the S state, right? Now at the same time, you will flush the value to the memory because S state says, the data which is present in the caches is also same in the DRAM, right? And then finally, whenever, uh, let's say, other code wants to write and you have the value in the M state, then you have to flush it out and then uh, the other code will actually go to M state and you will go to I state, right? Because, because now no, uh, your value is no longer uh, valid. And then uh, similarly, when um, someone wants to uh, right and you are in the s state you will just move to the i state right so let's take an example and uh, hope this will make it much uh, clearer so let's say processor one starts uh, a read it sends a bus read and the interconnect get the data from the dram it's in the s state now no issue processor p2 uh, sorry processor p1 again wants to write uh, or modify something so now uh, the value of x will change from one to two and the state has moved from s to m that means now this guy is the owner okay now let's say p3 wants to read uh remember so the updated value is actually with this guy right because he's the owner so what will happen uh this guy will send a request which will get propagated to all the cores so there is a circuitry called snooper who will actually check whether there is anything uh, that is coming for a block that I have uh, and I'm the owner. And if there's a tag hit, 
then then uh, that particular code has to respond so that's what will happen here and eventually what will happen is this guy has to flush the data into dram and both of them will go to their state okay eventually we'll flush it out and then then the value of uh, dram will also uh, change to uh, two and there's no need of uh, DRAM read from this course perspective because this guy was the owner, this guy communicated the data to this other guy, right? So now this is the state. Again, we are in a pretty uh, steady state. All are in S state, even the DRAM contains the updated value, right? Now, if this guy wants to write, that means this guy should go to M state and then write. If this guy wants to uh, write and move to M state, that means all other blocks which are uh, there in other codes should be invalidated, right? Because now this guy will update the value to three, right? So that's what will happen now. This guy is invalidated and uh, this guy has updated its value to three, right? So finally, if you want to read, let's say any other code wants to read, again, this code has an invalid copy. So now you have to send a request. This guy has the updated value, this guy will respond and uh, all of them will go to the state eventually and the DRAM will be updated. So that's what will happen now. So three is present in all the cases, states have been changed to S and eventually the DRAM will also be updated. Okay, hope this animation is clear uh, and then uh, you can actually uh, get, a, get a better picture uh, by, by going through this example again and again. Okay. So once you are in a particular state, if you are getting a future read, then there is no need to communicate to other codes because like you are free to do any uh, reads, right? Okay. So this is just a summary for you guys to try it out. Uh, the same thing that we have seen so far, you can uh, try to fill this uh, CAS coherence uh, transitions uh, and then try to put the states that uh, this course will uh, be, uh, the, the course will be actually using for all these transitions. So with that, uh, I will stop here. Thank you.